I invite you, if I could, to open your Bibles to the Gospel according to Mark. Mark chapter 1, verses 40 through 45. We are concluding the first chapter in Mark as we walk through our glorious study of this particular Gospel. And let's remember as we read these five verses, they are... God speaking to us about His Son. There are not more precious and valuable and authoritative words in the world. Let's read together. Mark chapter 1, verse 40. And a leper came to Him, imploring Him. And kneeling, said to him, if you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town but was out in desolate places, and people were coming to him from every quarter. Lord, bless the preaching of your word. I was born an untouchable. So says Sujatha Gidla in her book, Ants Among Elephants. I was born an untouchable, she says. She says this, I explain it like this, the untouchables whose special role, whose hereditary duty is to labor in the fields of others or to do other work that Hindu society considers filthy are not allowed to live in the village at all. They must live outside the boundaries of the village proper. They are not allowed to enter temples, not allowed to come near sources of drinking water used by other castes, not allowed to eat sitting next to a caste Hindu or to use the same utensils. There are thousands of other such restrictions and indignities that vary from place to place. Every day in an Indian newspaper, you can read of an untouchable beaten or killed for wearing sandals, for riding a bicycle. This morning, we're going to study another untouchable, one who had no hope of rescue, but who received the touch of someone who could save him. And more importantly, in that rescue, we are going to see our own story because the Bible says that in the eyes of our Creator, we were all born untouchable. We are all unworthy. We are all unclean. And we are made this way not by the rules of men or false religions, but by something in our own souls. And there is only one who can rescue us. Mark wants to compel us to bring our unclean lives to Jesus Christ, to tell us that Jesus Christ can rescue every unclean life. I want to walk through this story first, and then I'll seek to apply it to our lives for a few areas of application. Let's walk through it in in three sections. First, the healing, then the secret, and then 
the outcast. The healing begins in verse 40. A leper came to him, that's Jesus, imploring him and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Now, we cannot appreciate this story unless we appreciate the desperate nature of this man's condition. Leprosy described any number of skin conditions, including the modern Hansen's disease, which we often think of when we think of leprosy. And in that extreme case, the body itself begins to rot away as a result of the disease. Lepers could lose their extremities, parts of their body, as the disease ate away at them. But beyond the physical torment of this man was the ritual uncleanness that this condition created for a Jew. Leprosy, under the law of Moses, was a, a kind of living metaphor of the spiritual uncleanness that every person has because of sin. That's true of many laws in the Old Testament. God created specific physical metaphors as a, a kind of living illustration of the exile from God's presence that must happen because of humanity's rebellion against him. Lepers were declared not just unwell, but unclean. They were unable to live among God's people or to associate with them. Commentator James Edwards helps us to get a glimpse of this reality. He says this, The person with such an infectious disease must wear torn clothes, let his hair be unkempt, cover the lower part of his face, and cry out, Unclean! Unclean! As long as he has the infection, he remains unclean. He must live alone. He must live outside the camp. This is not simply the description of an illness. It is a sentence. Lepers were victims of far more than the disease itself. The disease robbed them of their health. The sentence imposed on them as a consequence robbed them of their name, occupation, habits, family, fellowship, and worshiping community. To ensure against contact with society, lepers were required to make their appearance as repugnant as possible. Josephus speaks of the banishment of lepers as those in no way differing from a corpse. The reference to Miriam's leprosy in Numbers 12.12 prompted various rabbis to speak of lepers as the living dead, whose cure was as difficult as raising the dead. The diagnosis of leprosy thus encompassed medical and social dimensions. Leprosy contaminated Israel's status as the holy people, although, notice this, it did not contaminate the Gentiles since they were already considered unclean. Other illnesses had to be healed, but leprosy, leprosy had to be cleansed. In this desperate and hopeless state comes the leper, kneeling, begging him, if you will, you can make me clean. Jesus' response in that culture is just as shocking as this man's boldness. Moved with pity. That, that word that's there actually might be, the right word actually might be indignation or even anger. One gets the impression from that word that, that Jesus, faced with the ravages of sin, is indignant and is about to do battle. He stretched out his hand. And touched him. Incredible moment for the untouchable to be touched. He touched him and said, I will be clean. One of Mark's favorite words he uses, I'm sure with great joy here, immediately the leprosy left him. The Savior who is on the move is on the move cleansing lepers now. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. Instantly the man's prison of helplessness, his state of shame and exile is reversed. Rather than defiling Jesus by his touch, Jesus sets this prisoner free. 
The year of the Lord's favor, the messianic age, breaks in and the prisoner is unleashed. He is unchanged. The leper is cleansed. The one who is dead, the living dead, is now made alive. The unclean, unworthy, is now made worthy and clean. This is an unmistakable evidence of the breaking in of God's kingdom, which Jesus has been announcing as good news since the beginning of this chapter. Now, how are we to relate to this story? I highly doubt that anyone here has leprosy. And yet, all of us were born untouchables spiritually, were we not? Since leprosy was meant to illustrate the reality of people's uncleanness in the sight of God, I think we can see in this person a living metaphor of our uncleanness apart from the touch of the Lord Jesus. Actually, the same Greek word root is used when they translated Isaiah's cry in Isaiah 6 when he saw the Lord and said, Woe to me, I am a man of, here's the word, unclean lips. I'm a man of unclean lips, and you see that same root word used repeatedly here. He asked to be made clean. Jesus says, I will be clean, and then he says, show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded. What Isaiah saw when he saw the Lord was the reality that he, like a leper, was unclean because of the state of his soul. And Jesus said that ultimately it is not the outside of a man or woman that makes them unclean, but what is in their heart. When he said in Mark chapter 7, what comes out of a person is what defiles him from within. Out of the heart of man comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness, spiritual leprosy, we might say. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. Pastor J.C. Ryle helps us to understand this connection. He says, is there nothing like leprosy among ourselves? Yes, indeed, there is. There is a foul soul disease which is ingrained into our very nature and cleaves to our bones and marrow with deadly force. That disease is the plague of sin. And like leprosy, it is a deep-seated disease infecting every part of our nature, heart, will, conscience, understanding, memory, and affections. Like leprosy, it makes us loathsome and abominable, unfit for the company of God and unfit for the glory of heaven. Like Leprosy, it is incurable by any earthly physician and is slowly but surely dragging us down to the second death. And worst of all, far worse than leprosy, it is a disease from which no mortal man is except. We are all in God's sight as an unclean thing. The Bible says that we are meant to see ourselves in the story of the leper. All of us were born untouchables. Our sin is a great spiritual leprosy that makes our entrance into the presence of God unthinkable and absolutely forbidden. So this, this truly is the healing we need. This is the healing we need. This is the touch that we need or needed, this is where we were apart from encountering the Lord Jesus Christ who offers the only rescue for every spiritual leper. And yet, there is more to this healing than simply a touch and a word. And if we want to know the one who heals lepers, we must notice, look down at your Bibles and notice the surprising instructions that follow. Did you notice that? Verse 43 should strike us as surprising, should it not? And we always want to notice in narratives of the Bible when there's something unexpected. The the writers insert unexpected things to catch our attention. They don't have neon signs or blazing digital banners. So they do things unexpected to make a very important point. This is a separate section of this passage. I might caption the secret. Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, see that you say nothing to 
anyone, but go, show yourself to the priests, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. He turns with urgency to the healed leper, undoubtedly overjoyed, and commands him, do not spread the news of this healing. Now, doesn't that catch you off guard? I'm sure it caught the man off guard and anybody around off guard. Why is Jesus urgent and why stern? Why so much direct (laughs) requirement at this age? Why why is Jesus doing this? Well, this, this is what is known as the Markan secret. We've always already noticed it when Jesus commands demons to not announce him. Do not, he said to the demons, say who I am. And that's meant to be this kind of enticing surprise in the book of Mark. The Bible is a holy book. It is God's book, but it is a book. And sometimes the meaning of the book comes through the ways books normally communicate. Things like surprises, mysteries, Why is he doing this, we're meant to ask. Why the urgency? Why the sternness? Jesus, you just touched a leper. Why a stern requirement towards secrecy? Why? Very important. We're going to notice this again and again. This is the first healing where we see it in Mark. Mark Strauss, the commentator, helps us understand why this secret likely takes place. As with the silencing of demons... The command likely has to do with both the nature of Jesus' messianic identity and the timing of its revelation. The people are looking for a political Messiah who will free them from their Roman oppressors. While eventually acknowledging his messianic identity, Jesus will define his messianic role as the Son of Man who will suffer and die as a ransom for sin. As to its timing, rumors surrounding Jesus' identity risk inciting the crowds to a messianic furor and so thwarting his plans to proclaim the kingdom of God throughout the towns and villages of Galilee. A premature and misinformed revelation of Jesus' identity will create hindrance to his essential mission. So why is he doing this? Why is Jesus, who just healed a leper, telling that leper, serious. Do not tell anyone. Why is he doing that? Why? There's a point in that command. There's a glory in that secret. It is because his primary purpose is not to be a popular healer or a political messiah, but an exiled redeemer. What Jesus does not want to happen is as important as what he does want to happen in this passage. He will not be the political king that the crowds are looking for. He will not even be the popular healer that they're wanting him to be. Not yet. He will heal, but he will not gain popularity through his healing. He will rescue, but he will not gain prominence through his rescuing. He will defeat demons, but he will not be known as the king that they are looking for. Why? Because this king has a mission that they did not expect. This king has a purpose that they were not anticipating. This This leper-cleansing Savior has a salvation much greater than they could know about. And so he says, quiet. Do not announce me, lest my mission of exile be undermined. The truth behind the secret is emphasized again by his requirement for the leper to go to the priests. He's referencing a passage in Leviticus that talks about when a leper is cleansed, the offering that should be offered in payment for their cleansing. Leviticus 14 says this, The rest of the oil that is in the priest's hand he shall put on the head of him who is to be cleansed. Then the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord. The priest shall offer the sin offering to make atonement for him who is to be cleansed from his uncleanness. And afterward he shall kill the burnt offering. And the priest shall offer the burnt offering and the grain offering on the altar. 
Thus the priest shall make atonement for him, and he shall be clean. When Jesus says, go to the priests and offer what Moses commanded, he's referencing this passage for a proof to them. He is saying, there is someone I do want to know about this. I want the priest to get a testimony in your healing and in your offering that the messianic age has arrived in me, and I want the symbolic offerings for your cleansing to take place because I believe in them. And the reason I believe in them is that I came to fulfill them. Jesus was not indifferent to the Mosaic law. He was not indifferent to blood offerings for sin. Quite the contrary. He was determined that they should continue until such time as they were no longer needed. He was not indifferent to the symbolic offering of lambs in payment for unclean sinners. No. Actually, he commanded this man to fulfill that command. Why? Because that offering, like thousands of others, had a very specific end point, a very specific trajectory. And the secret mission is the mission to fulfill that offering. The secret that nobody would have anticipated is contained in the symbolism of an offered lamb paying for a cleansed leper. This is the secret we need to know, do we not? And we do know, because we know the Messiah has come with all of God's power to reverse the curse and its effects. But surprisingly, he's determined to shun popularity and earthly power in order to fulfill his mission, and he will work to fulfill the requirements of the law. Now, our society and our own pride tend to assume that God will welcome most people, and certainly normally we include ourselves. God will bring everybody in who hasn't been too bad, and in that deceit we often live, and we often cut ourselves off. From the gratefulness we are meant to experience that the untouchables can come in. Jesus offers cleansing, but not to healthy bound saints, but to lepers. The only people who will be in heaven, other than God and the angels, are spiritual lepers. There will be a great crowd around the throne on that day. It will be a crowd of lepers singing because the Messiah was not interested in temporary popularity or even in temporary healing so much as in permanent rescue. But Mark is not done helping us to understand the spiritual meaning behind this one who touches the untouchables with mercy. So we move on to the third section, which I would label the outcast. The outcast, the leper, understandably, we can hardly blame him, uh, goes out and begins to talk freely about it in contradiction to Jesus' word. Yes, it was disobedience, but honestly, I can't blame him that much. He goes out and talks freely about it. I mean, it would be difficult not to. I, I, I notice... I don't know if this happened exactly, but I noticed you have fingers. How did that happen? I mean, there had to be some moment of explanation. Boy, you seem to be around a lot more often, and your skin's not falling off anymore. Would you mind telling me what took place? I mean, difficult not to spread the news, but this man, in contradiction to Jesus' requirements, spreads the news, and the result is that Jesus can no longer openly enter a town, but is out in desolate places. Now, notice... Mark's reversal in this passage. Did you notice that? That's not an accident. Mark can pack an incredible novel into five verses, and he does. Notice. Notice there is a great reversal. At the beginning, the outcast comes to Jesus, who is the popular teacher. But at the end, the outcast is in. And the popular teacher is out. Did you notice that reversal? Who's out at the end of these five verses? Jesus. Who's the one who can no longer openly enter towns and villages? 
Jesus. And the reason he can't is for the same reason that he said there should be a secret because he is determined not to garner a popular messianic revival. No, he doesn't want that. And so therefore his mission requires him to be on the outside. So the healing of the leper and the word spreading of the leper requires the one who saved the leper to be outside while the leper is inside. And Mark is making a theological point. There is a great reversal that takes place. And Mark beautifully describes it in a few short verses. Actually, one, one commentator, James Edwards, I read, captions this entire story. Jesus trades places with the leper. Because that's what happened. And of course, people are still coming to him because he can save lepers and cast out demons. But he must now be outside. He is required to be in exile functionally. He is removed from that which is inside in the same way that the unclean one had to be outside. And in some ways, this little five-verse story summarizes the entire story of the Bible. Does it not? Doesn't it summarize the entire story of the Bible? There are lepers who are unclean, who cannot come in, who are ruined and then suddenly they are in, healed, restored, and yet there is one who was in the ultimate place of inside affection and worship and glory who is outside in order to rescue them. Who is the one outside the camp? The healer. Who is the one inside? The leper. Incredible. The one who is the center of affection of heaven who is pure and clean and blazing and righteous beyond our imagination, begins the process for which he came. He comes to us outside the camp, and ultimately he is covered not only by our exile, but by our spiritual leprosy. And he takes our guilt upon himself. He is declared unclean and taken outside of the camp. He must be exiled, just as those animals were slaughtered in the temple in a symbol of atonement for cleansing. So Jesus will be taken outside the camp. He will be slaughtered in a true and final act of atonement for cleansing. I can only imagine when Jesus said to that man, go, tell the priests that you've been healed and offer what Moses commanded, the atoning death for your cleansing. He could only have been anticipating the reason those offerings would come to an end. Frederick Lee, he helps us to feel the theology of this. Whatever was unclean was taken outside the holy city. The carcasses of animals offered as sacrifices on the Day of Atonement were to be burned outside the camp. Citing this, the writer to the Hebrews continues, So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. He continues, Little did those who led the Savior outside the city walls to Golgotha realize the significance of their action. To them, the prisoner must be ejected from their midst, outside the gates, Christ the untouchable. As the priests hustled Christ outside the gates, they ministered in spite of themselves to the preparation of the one and final sacrifice for sin. What takes place in this passage? A leper comes to Jesus. He receives miraculous physical healing and more importantly, spiritual restoration to the people of God. Because of the news about this Savior and because of his determination to fulfill a much more important cleansing, Jesus is then required to be exiled. The people are still going to him outside the camp, but he cannot come into the camp. Mark is anticipating the end of his book. He is showing us in a, a short and beautiful picture what Jesus came to do. He is revealing to each one of us what our most fundamental spiritual story is that you were outside the camp, 
that you were unclean and that there was one who was appropriately inside the center of heaven's affections. And yet somehow he came to you outside the camp. He touched you. He made you clean. And now because he went outside the camp and was covered with our spiritual leprosy called sin, we have been brought in. Mark is saying there is one. There is one who can rescue any unclean life. There is one who can bring in every exile. And the means of his bringing them in is his own exile in their place. There is one who can touch the untouchable. There is one who can cleanse the uncleanable. There is one who can make worthy the unworthy. There is one moved with indignation at the ravages of sin who can bring into the camp those who would be outside the camp who can declare to the unclean one you are now clean and you are brought in because I will be unclean in your place my friends what difference does that make What difference? Before we close, let me give three kinds of lepers that this passage might come to this morning. Three kinds of lepers. First of all, the convicted leper. The one who knows right now, you know your heart is unclean. And I don't mean unclean in a general sense. You're a general sinner. I'm aware generally that I'm not as righteous as I should be. I'm talking about a very specific area of your life where you know you are unclean. Where like Isaiah, in the presence of God, and you are in the presence of God right now, because when the church gathers, God is there among us. And he sees through and past the facade and the casual Christianity which is harming the church. And he sees right to every corner of our heart and our desires and our cravings and our secrets. And you are aware, I am unclean. And you're convicted. Maybe you've been wanting to hold on to a particular sin rather than bringing it freely to Jesus for confession. But as surely as the leper could not be cleansed apart from coming to Jesus, you cannot be cleansed if you hold on to your sin. Sin is evil, isn't it? It, it entices us to stay in our leper cave. It convinces us that the sores and rotting of sin is better than the Son of God. How evil is sin to convince us to make that kind of exchange? And like the worst of leprosy, sin is never content to stay in one place. Let's not be deceived. Don't you be deceived this morning. Which of you, if you found out you had leprosy, would convince yourself it's not that bad, it's just in one place? It's, it's just in this one little area. It hasn't consumed me yet. I've, I've lost no limbs yet. My face is still intact as of right now. Who would say that physically and yet don't we say that spiritually? As if we think sin is content to say in one place. No, it is not. Sin spreads. Sin that is countenanced will spread. Sin that is indulged will spread. Leprosy unchecked will rot, and sin will rot the soul of the person who holds on to it. So let's admit, all of us, where, where is there some sin in our life that we have not been battling, we've just been indulging, we have not been confessing, we've been concealing? Where is that sin? 
Is there some of you, I think probably, some of us here today that are the convicted leper, that you know you are unclean? Look, don't be deceived. You can have just a little bit of spiritual leprosy because surely everyone understands how you've suffered or how difficult it is or how painful the circumstances are. Yes, but if you are holding on to leprosy, you are holding on to that thing that can send you worse than the grave. It can send you rotting below the grave into Young men, young women, let me speak to you. You are old enough to know what I mean when I say there is an uncleanness in your heart. And that uncleanness is more deadly than any rash that ever took place on your face. But there is one who can make you clean. But you to him. You must come to him. You must hear his words saying, I will be clean. Where is it? Identify it right now. Whether you're young or whether you're old, identify it right now. Let there be no hiding lepers in the cave quieting their own conscience and neglecting to come to the very one who can cleanse them. Identify it now. It is more urgent than physical leprosy because it can send you certainly into God's final judgment. I don't speak to you with assurance. Even if you profess faith in Jesus, if you are clinging to some hidden sin, don't think first of assurance. Think first of urgency. Those who would have assurance in Jesus are those who confess their sins against Jesus. So if you are the convicted leper and you know your heart is unclean, do not wait to expose it to the Lord Jesus Christ and to ask for him to forgive you and make you clean. He wills to heal lepers. Second category, the doubting leper. Those who doubt your heart can be cleaned. You are conflicted. You would come, but you doubt that he wills to cleanse you. Perhaps you have come before and you're sure all of your cleansing chances have been used up. But notice, Jesus never turns away the one who comes to him. Did you know that? Jesus never turns away the one who comes to him. It is not the worthiness of this man that is considered. We're not even told how worthy or unworthy he was to be cleansed. It's not the level of our faith that is measured. It is the object of it. It's the person we turn to, not the strength in our turning, that is the reason we are cleansed. Here is the Savior who came to rescue worthless sinners. And there have been many just as worthless as you. There never yet was a person who came to Jesus in the depth of their sinfulness with genuine repentance and a plea for cleansing that he did not wash by his grace. He did not hesitate to touch the untouchable and he will not hesitate to give mercy to you if you bring your mercy to him. To add doubt to our sin is to add sin on top of sin and to malign the great physician as though he does not know the cure for your disease. Should the sick person malign the doctor who is even then ready to heal him? Should the sinner tell the Savior what he cannot do? Cast aside your doubt and every lie of the enemy of your own heart that you are beyond help and come... Don't be distracted by whether you came before or whether it was genuine or not. Simply come to the Lord Jesus and hear his voice. I will be clean. Finally, the unaffected leper. Those who've forgotten the cost of your cleansing. How many of us are like those lepers cleansed in the Gospel of Luke? 
who quickly forgot the one who had cleansed them. Though this man disregarded the warning of Jesus, surely we can't hold it too greatly against him because his heart was overflowing with joy. And he must tell others of what has been done for him. But how easy it is for the Christian to forget that Christ was exiled so we could be brought near. How easy to forget that he was loaded with our shame so that we could receive honor. How easy to forget that he bore our spiritual leprosy on the tree and was made a curse and a shame for us. Should not cleansed lepers be happy people? Should not forgiven sinners be grateful people? Should there be any more happy, grateful people in the world than Christians? Should there be any more rejoicing people in the world than those who have heard that voice say, I will be clean? Christians have caused to be the most grateful and affectionate people in the world. Spiritual lepers with rotting souls, the exiles of heaven and headed toward hell, are now whole, clean, spiritual children welcomed into the family room of God. And only because the Son of God was made an unclean one in their place and sent away into the wilderness to die for them. Here is the beloved Son who deserves our love and our gratefulness and our witness and our worship. And surely every reader of this passage who was met by Jesus on that road can say, He, He is my joy and my righteousness and my salvation. And my life is spent exulting in the joy of renewing and remembering that voice that said, I will be clean. Listen, casual Christianity is damaging the church and maligning the Lord Jesus Christ. Let there be no casual Christians who sing the songs of redemption with a cold heart and attend messages unaffected. The only Christians that are Christians are cleansed lepers. Let them sing as though they remember that. former slave trader turned pastor and hymn writer John Newton wrote a hymn that in his manuscript was simply titled The Leper. All of us have this as our spiritual history. Let's enjoy these words as we close. Oft as the leper's case I read, my own described I feel. Sin is a leprosy indeed, which none but Christ can heal. A while I would have passed for well and strove my spots to hide till it broke out incurable, too plain to be denied. Then... From the saints I sought to flee and dreaded to be seen. I thought they all would point at me and cry, unclean, unclean. What anguish did my soul endure till hope and patience ceased. The more I strove myself to cure, the more the plague increased. While thus I lay distressed. I saw the Savior passing by to him, though filled with shame and awe, I raised my mournful cry, Lord, you can heal me if you will, for you can all Cleanse my leprous soul from guilt. My filthy heart renew. He heard and 
with a gracious look, pronounced the healing word. I will be clean. And while he spoke, I felt my health restored. Come, lepers. Seize the present hour. The Savior's grace to prove. He can relieve, for he is power. He will, for he is love. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that as we sing this final song, I pray that convicted lepers that are here would freely confess their sins to you and to others. I pray doubting lepers would draw near to the throne of grace. And Lord, I pray that every cleansed leper would find new joy and gratefulness. Receive our affection. Thank you for taking our place, for making us clean. Receive our worship, Lord Jesus.